coming to you from the Star City. This is Scarlet Fever, a daily Nebraskan production. Well, the championship mindset that found itself in Columbus forgot to fly back home on the plane. Hmm. Welcome into Scarlet Fever. It's November 3rd today after Nebraska UCLA. A very gloomy, disappointing day at Memorial Stadium where the Huskers fell 27 to 20 to the Bruins. And we are here to give you the full rundown and some other things as well. Good to have you back. Danny Berg's here. Ben Droz is here. Hi, Ben. How are you today? I'm I'm doing pretty well all things considered all things considered yeah i i would agree there it is what it is now you know, that we have to talk about it now that we had a night to sleep on it I, it i still feel the same uh, yeah but at least it's not very <laughs> you know we're just start blaring things out I, of I nowhere j- i joked to danny after the game i was like we should do scarlet fever right now yeah, i mean we very well could have and <laughs> i was kind of in the mood for it but ben was like nah i'm tired i want to go home and i didn't blame him and I shortly passed. Now you're passed. making me seem lazy. Yeah, not really. <laughs> we're, we're, we are doing it the day at. We usually don't record our football show the day after a game. So this is something a little yeah, different. It's a football Sunday. Football Sunday, but you are hearing this on a Monday. This is the first time you get to hear it is on November 4th. And you'll, you'll get your fill as you drive into work. And oh yeah, we, we got some, some burning thoughts and we're going to get into it. So like we usually have been trying to do we're going to start with try the keyword yes we're going to try the keyword we're going to get into ben's position grades Ooh. so let's go right through them we're just going to go let's right we're just going to go th- through them all quarterback got a d running backs got a b minus receivers c plus offensive line got a c defensive line got a b minus linebackers got a b plus the secondary got a d and special teams got a b plus Yep, there it is. So there it is. There it is. So let's start with the glaringly obvious is Dylan Royal. I think this is his worst grade of the year. Yes. He got a, I think it was a C- in the Rutgers game. I think I think I did a C-. minus. I think I did a C for Rutgers and a C- minus for Ohio State. Or maybe other way around. I don't remember. But Something around the low Cs. First D for him. Though. But, but still got a D. And it was... I... He just he just didn't look comfortable at all. No, and that, and that's the exact right word to put it. And Rule said post game that I mean he didn't want to put words in Rayola's mouth, but he kind of said that he was a little uncomfortable. Was what Rule kind of like that's kind of how he was feeling. Was that he thought Rayola looked a little uncomfortable back there, and I mean you could see it. I mean UCLA, especially in that first half, he kind of settled down after the pick six in the second half. He settled down a little bit, was was doing a little bit better, but in that entire first half and in the beginning of the second half, I mean, he just he, he really looked like a freshman. Like UCLA was bringing a lot of pressure, especially up the middle, and I just feel like he was just seeing so much at, in, in such a short amount of time that it was just kind of overwhelming to him. And it's really odd to me because, I mean, at the beginning of the year, he just looked so cool, calm, and collected. Like against Colorado, he was so calm and collected. Like he he I mean, there was an immense kind of pressure on that game. It was a Saturday night game against a big rival for Nebraska, Colorado. Especially what happened last year. Rayola comes in and he has a really I mean, he didn't have an amazing game, but he had a pretty good game against Colorado. And then even in the Illinois game, that was another big game. He he had a good game. I mean, it's just like ever since October started, it was that Rutgers game. He, I mean, he's just really looked uncomfortable, and I think defenses are now kind of starting to realize if you if you put a lot of pressure on him, which that's kind of saying the obvious for freshman quarterbacks or really any quarterback. But if you put a lot of pressure on him, he kind of looks like a deer caught in the headlights a little bit. I mean, that, that's kind of the analogy I want to put, and I want to let you get your thoughts in on this too. But I mean, the talent is there. That's the one thing I want to say. The talent is obviously there. Like Rayola is a uber talented quarterback he has a great arm he showed it in flashes on Saturday he had that great throw to Ja'Cory Barney he had a really good throw at Isaiah Nair in in the red zone he had the back shorter throw the Nair he put it only where Nair could get it I mean he he makes good throws but then other times you just kind of scratch your head and you're thinking what are you doing yeah and I think one thing I was critical about for Rayola yesterday was the fact that his reads just looked really off 
Mm-hmm. They they didn't look like they had been in the past, and there was on the Barney play where they got forty yards. I think it was Emma Johnson who was wide open in the flat to the left, mm-hmm. and Rayola completely like missed him on his read, and decided to try and thread the needle to Jacory Barney. I think it was it was a two on one, and and Barney was able to make that catch, but barely. But he had a guy wide open to his left. There was another play on the pick six where I'm not sure what he was looking at, but Fedoni was wide open over the middle of the he field. He was trying to go to Fedoni. He was, he was trying to go to him, but I don't know where the read went wrong. I think he didn't see the linebacker underneath. Some, something went wrong there. And there was a couple other instances. And funny enough, it was usually when the running back was going out and running a route to give a check down option or maybe a deeper check down option, depending on what the play was. And Rayola was just completely missing him, missing him on the reads. Mm-hmm. We were talking about it during the game, and we we were actually sitting next to a couple of the UCLA beat writers, and they brought up a point which I think makes a lot of sense now that we're talking about it in hindsight, that it seems like Rayola knows who he wants to go to, and he's dead set on getting it to that person. That's what... And this that may be totally off base, and I I can understand where people would think that that is off base, but based on yesterday's performance, that's what it looked like to the naked eye. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna strike that down and say that's completely wrong. Um, I don't think that's the case all the time, but I think there are instances where he know like he's trying to make the big play. He knows he has a really big arm, and he's just kind of dead set on making the big play. Um, but I, I don't want to say that's indicative of him on every play. Like there's sometimes where, I mean, he, I feel like like he he's good at times at checking it down to the flat. Like he he knows when to do that. Like he showed that earlier in the year. Like when he had to check it down to the flat, he did. Like it's not like he was like, oh, I got. I was like, this is supposed to go to Nair. I'm only gonna throw it to Nair. Like I feel like we didn't see that at the beginning of the year. So, I don't know. I feel like this is something that's kind of been recent where yeah, he's re- – I mean, I don't want to say he's always trying to go for the big play, but he's always trying to make a play, you know, kind of trying to be the – um, trying to kind of trying to play hero ball a little bit. You know what I mean? So, here, here here's here's a stat for you. So, Rayola finished with 177 passing yards for the game. Yes. Okay? So, 148 of those yards of the 177 – were put together on five plays mm-hmm. that each went for over 20 yards. Yeah. He, he's so just, there were, there he's, were five big plays mm-hmm. that counted up to 148 yards of that 177. He's trying to make the big plays, but the thing is, especially yesterday, was those were really the only huge plays that he was making. Every other pass that he was making was just, and we'll get into this later, but was for very short yardage or for negative yardage. Yeah, and that's with those screen plays. Um, we'll get to yeah, that. But yeah, I mean, he, I mean, I, I just, he's really trying to make the big play. And I don't think he was trying to make the big play early in the game. I think that happened after, especially after the pick six, and the team was down 20 to seven. Rayola was just really trying to get Nebraska back in that game and just making, trying to play hero ball, trying to make that big play. And, when you're down, you know, twenty to seven, I mean, I don't want to say you're kind of forced into doing that, but I feel like he probably thought he was forced into that a little bit. But even in the first half, I mean, on that Jacory Barney play, again trying to make the big play and he did make it, but there's, I mean, there was just a lot of easier passes to be made on that because that could have easily went in a completely opposite way where that could have been a pick or incomplete because he's throwing a really tight window and double coverage. And it was a great throw. Great throw, great catch. Like It was a really good play. And that's you see flashes of that, and you know, okay, he Rail is uber-talented with his physical traits. I feel like right now it's just kind of mental. Like it, It's all mental. Like You mm-hmm. know you see Rayola's pocket pres- presence at times, that it, it's really amazing seeing him avoid defenders that are coming. Like Sometimes there's unblocked defenders, and he makes them miss. Like, the way he moves around the pocket, some of the throws he makes downfield. I mean, you you can see why he's a five star quarterback. Yep. But other times you can also see, okay, he's a freshman. Yeah, and there was there was a point in the in the second half 
it was on their second I think it was their second drive of of the of the second half so about midway through the third quarter and he started going on a passing run he looked like he had figured something out after the pick six happened after oh, yeah. all the struggles of the first half happened he ripped off eight completions in a row he looked like he was finally getting into some kind of a groove not all of them were for super long yards. Like there was some, there was some short ones here and there. A couple of screen passes to Fedoni, mm-hmm. but he was he was trying to go long. He got the twenty seven yarder to Barn. He got the the over the shoulder touchdown to to Nair. Another deep shot to Nair. Got Banks for a long one too. Like he was finally starting to figure it out a little bit, but he's still just again with the reads. He was he was still struggling with some of those reads. And sometimes just not making the right decision. And yeah, in that streak, there was no drops. They were all completions. But there was definitely some better options of guys that were just waiting for the ball to fall into their hands. Yeah. And that happened. It was it was the first time yesterday. It, yesterday was the first time that I had like especially noticed this. I, I I don't have a doubt that it was that's probably been happening for probably the last two three games, especially the last two games. I mean, I mean yeah, the away games. I mean, when you're watching on TV, it's it's hard to see it on yeah. TV, and I'm sure some of the people will, were that were there, they'd be able to express on it further. But this is the first time that I've noticed it where Rayola has just missed wide open people and tried to make the tough throw. Yeah, and I mean, and not only misreading, I mean, just missing wide open guys too. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, go back to the Ohio State game. I mean, he missed Banks on the right side, just overthrew him, and then he overthrew Barney in the left in the uh, that corner of the end zone. I mean, and then even go back to the Illinois game, he overthrew Lindenmeyer on that touch on what would have been a touchdown pass to take the lead against Illinois in the fourth quarter. They then have to settle for a field goal, but John Hole misses it. I mean, just all these things, and I mean, you don't want to blame it. On a freshman quarterback, like he, like Grayle is it's not, not too. like he's not the reason that this team is five and four right now, and maybe on the precipice of being five and seven, missing a bull game. I w- like Grayle is part of it, but he's not it, like it, there's an overlying issue, and it's not all on Grayle. And I mean, this is kind of what happens when you put a freshman quarterback out there and you don't give him adequate. Offensive line play, you don't give him adequate skill positions, skill, skill position players. I mean, you don't put a scheme around him that he feels comfortable in. I mean, UCLA was just blitzing up the middle like crazy in that game. In that first half, they were just blitzing right down the middle. And I think Rail was just, he knew he had to get the ball out super fast. And it was just like, I think his head was kind of spinning. And it wasn't until that third quarter when he finally made a big play after they blitzed where you see way kind of backed off. And that's when you started seeing him look a little bit more comfortable. What's interesting too, when you bring up the blitzing is that that's exactly what worked for Ohio state. Mm-hmm. They were doing it basically every third down because, and, and they brought six or seven people the, the Ohio state did and they basically got Rayola every time where he had to throw the ball away. Well, and they didn't stop doing that until Rayola finally was able to connect on a hot mm-hmm. route to Nair on the, on the left side of the field. Like, he got it quick out of his hands. Nair went, I, I don't know what kind of route it was. I think he it was like an in route. I don't know. He cut in, and he, he threw a really good pass to Isaiah Nair, which got, was almost, a, they called it a touchdown initially, but then they downed it at the one, and then Dowdell jumped over the line, put it in, but... I mean, Rayo, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it feels like the offense doesn't adjust to the pressure or figure it out until late in the game. You know what I mean? Like, the Ohio State, they, they didn't finally score off of taking advantage of the pressure and there being less guys in coverage until the fourth quarter. Like, that was the fourth quarter when that happened, right? When they mm-hmm. took the lead? Like, yep. You, you, it, this is not, it's not something that should be figured out in the fourth quarter like, and then in the ucla game it wasn't until the middle of the third quarter at, like, at, these are kind of things that need to be figured out and like in game like that se- second quarter yeah like, that if it happens on your fir- on the first two drives of the game then fine so be it but that's something that should be figured out by the time the second quarter gets started and, and even before the game i mean you know this is what they're gonna do i mean even i mean real said it on his thursday presser ucla blitzes a lot and poise man coverage. That's what they that's what they do. 
what has Nebraska struggled against? Man press and blitz and, and heavy pressure on rail. That that is what they've struggled against. And he, they knew that's what they were gonna do, but they weren't able to take advantage like when you when they pressure the quarterback like crazy like that, there's somebody open. Like if you're rushing seven guys and you're only blocking four five like you have a five ounce of offensive lineman maybe you chip block a running back so they're bringing seven and you have six blocking somebody should be open somebody's got to be open Dude, yeah because you only got four you only got four people defending it's like like somebody's going to be open and you know there's some like i don't know it's like i understand i i it's not all on rail i mean this this is coaching one-on-one i feel like like you it is up to the coach to put in some of those hot routes or quick passing game to be, and I feel like that's what they're trying to do with the screen game, but the perimeter blocking is not good enough. I mean, they just don't have an answer to this blitz game, and they don't figure it out until second half later in the game. I want to wait to get to yelling at coaches because I want to. I want to give. You're going to be yelling at coaches. Yes, I'm not I. At coaches. Well, you you start you started talking a little bit about it, yeah. but I want to let's let's <laughs> keep going through this, and I want to talk about the secondary because they also got a really low grade this week. They got, they got they got a D as yes. well, and the shakiness just it just carried over from last week. They were arguably one of the when you look at all the position groups, they were one of the units that played the worst against Ohio State. Yes, and they definitely looked pretty bad against UCLA as well. Um, I mean that was kind of the worry, right? Coming into this game, I mean you knew UCLA really couldn't run the ball. They had more success than I thought they would running the ball. They, they actually ran the ball pretty decent against Nebraska. It was the first time this year that they got over 100 yards. Yeah. And, I mean, a lot of that was off of that one quarterback scramble. <laughs> right, for 57. Um, And we can get into that later. But but, but even if you take that away, they, they basically got 90 yards. Yeah. Um, but anyway, continue. Yeah, the uh, secondary, I mean, I want to first start by saying they're banged up. Hartzog's injured, banged up, not, I mean, he didn't even play in the game. Tommy Hill is not 100%. Deshaun Sing, I think it was either Singleton or Buford got banged up in the game against mm, UCLA. It, it, it was one of them. Um, the secondary, I mean, they had to start a freshman. They had to start a freshman in the secondary against in this game. Um, I'm forgetting his name. I think it's. Uh, I know Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Charles. Jeremiah, got Jeremiah Charles. Yeah, yep. that's who it is. So the secondary is banged up, and it was already kind of the weakest group at the defense. So I want to start by that. But still, if Ohio State would have came in. Last Saturday, and I said this on the show last week, if they would have came in and said, we're going to throw the ball 30 times, twi- I mean, if they only threw the ball 16 times. Let's say they were going to throw the ball twice as much. They were going to throw the ball 32 times. They would have beat Nebraska probably by, I don't know, 21, 17, 21 points. I mean, Nebraska, and UCLA just did that. They were like, okay, we're just going to throw the ball. They threw the ball 25 times, I believe, without checking the stat sheet. It was something like that, 25. To Just to go back on the injury, it was... Buford got banged up after Garbers had the 57-yard run, but he came in, came back in like two plays yeah, later. So, but still, I mean, not probably not 100. percent No. Um, but still, like the secondary, I mean, and, and UCLA threw the ball like 25 times and had a lot of success. Had a lot of success throwing the ball, and you kind of saw that against Ohio State. They just really wanted to get the run game going, and they were kind of, I don't want to say they're playing with their food, but they kind of Ohio State was like, oh, we're gonna win this game. We can do whatever and then when nebraska finally took the lead they're like okay we need to start like <laughs> we need to start we need to figure it out yeah, figure it out and then they started throwing the ball a little bit more and then they scored the touchdown but you see i mean you knew they were going to come in and throw the ball a lot i mean you knew it and that's exactly what they did and you see away receivers were just they were just open like the, the secondary was just really struggling and the, like you see was getting a lot of intermediate passes over the middle kind of on the sidelines, and then they broke the one deep down the left side. Um, I'm not sure who had the blown coverage on that play, but, I mean, they had the 47-yard touchdown on the left side of the field. So, I mean, yeah, the secondary really struggled, and it got better in the late in the second half, like second part of the third quarter and then fourth quarter. Secondary was better. UCLA offense kind of went conservative a little bit. But, yeah, the, the secondary has been a problem all year. And I think it's going to be continue to be a problem. The, the thing is, though, is that USC is kind of the only other team that has a, I don't want to say competent passing attack, but like a passing attack that scares you. I mean, Iowa's not going to come in and throw the ball 25 times. 
No. I mean, that's not good. And, 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 and Wisconsin, same same deal. Not quite to the extreme of Iowa, but I mean, USC is kind of the only other team that's going to be able to do that. So I don't know. I it, It's not, I don't, I think it, it's going to be an issue against USC. After that, it's probably not going to be that big of an issue, the secondary. Blown coverage. Want to know who it, who it was? Who was it? It was Tommy Hill and Deshaun Singleton. Mm. Not, I mean, not surprising. Singleton hasn't been the best in coverage. He's just been he he's he racks up a lot of tackles though. Singleton always is kind of one of the team leaders in tackles. He he makes plays, you know, downhill. So, but yeah, Singleton not not amazing in in coverage. Herzog has gotten a lot of he's gotten a decent amount of interceptions this year, mm-hmm. but he hasn't been amazing in pass coverage either. Gifford's not much of a coverage person. I feel like he's more of a guy you want to, you know, bring downfield, um, bring downhill, try to stop the run game. Yeah, the, I mean the coverage, and then you know Tommy Hill's banged up. I mean it, it's just the consistency the co- has just not been there this year. I mean when when is the secondary point? I don't know what game they played great in. I mean you could say the Colorado game, but even the I'm Colorado- talking about the unit as a whole. Oh, defense? Yes. Okay, we can get into that. But the secondary all year, I mean, the the best game is probably what? the I don't know, either Purdue, which didn't have a good passing attack, or Colorado, which Shooter Sanders was like doing Raiola in this game where he was just getting— He was getting swarmed. He, he had, yeah, no no time. And, I mean, Shooter Sanders is one of the better quarterbacks in college football. It just shows when you're getting pressured like that, it's really hard for a quarterback. Mm-hmm. But we can—yeah, the defense as a whole, and that was one of my takeaways was— yeah, Ben wrote two stories for this game. How about in, in, it? Inconsistency. I mean, we we know what this defense can do, and they've shown it in spurts. Like, they've shown in spurts that, okay, this is an elite defense. But then at other times, you're just thinking, I mean, the secondary has holes. Sometimes the defensive line gets pushed around. The linebackers just look, eh, sometimes. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's just it's really fascinating, the inconsistency. You go to Illinois. You have Illinois come here. Defense doesn't look great. That you then have Purdue Rutgers defense looks pretty good. They have a then they get trounced by Indiana, fifty six to seven. Bounce back against Ohio State. Have probably the best defensive performance of the of the rural era. And then you come back and you do this against UCLA, where the defense wasn't the biggest problem in the game. But I mean, the defense was kind of the reason why. I mean, UCLA had thirteen and a half, and I mean. It should have been 21. I mean, it easily could have been more. So, yeah, the defense has just been inconsistent. I mean, that first, I mean, UCLA ran, I think, 21 plays to Nebraska's three in the first quarter. I can ex- yeah, I I'll mean, get it, that number for you real it, quick. It was, I mean, Nebraska, I mean, UCLA had the ball first, drove all the way down, got a field goal. That took like half the quarter. Nebraska three and out. And then UCLA, next drive. Took all the way until the beginning of the second quarter. Nebraska yep. only had three off. They had play. three play. So here, if you want the halftime, I here you, here you go. Time possession. So there's 30 minutes and a half. In case you didn't know this in college football. What? <laughs> Nebraska only had the ball for nine minutes and 15 seconds. Yeah. You said they had it for 20 minutes and 45 seconds. And in that first quarter it was even worse. Nebraska only had one drive in the first quarter. They had one. Correct. They had one drive in the first quarter. Went three and out. Correct. Um, so the first two drives for UCLA was eight minutes. That was 14 plays. That was the one that ended in the field goal. And then the second one was six minutes and 37 seconds. That went touchdown. Uh, that that was the touchdown. That one went um, 11 plays for uh, 85 yards. Yeah. But Nebraska's first drive was only 91 seconds. They got two yards out of it. They had to punt it away. Yes. And then UCLA got the ball back and they took it into the second quarter. They I mean, had they had three plays. Yeah. It it was um not yeah, the and the defense couldn't get off the field. And I mean you can't really I mean, yeah, the offense went three and out really fast, but like that wasn't on the offense in the first quarter. I mean, yes, you went three and out on the first possession, but like if the defense can't like the defense couldn't get off the field at the beginning mm-hmm. of the game. They they just and it wasn't like UCLA, like if UCLA my kind of thought was, I kind of thought UCLA was going to get some big chunk plays towards the beginning of the game, because that's kind of what Eric Bianami does, draws up some stuff that you haven't seen before. But they were just marching down the field. I didn't expect them to just be able to march down the field like that, just like sustain a drive. And you even saw that in the northern uh, beginning of the year, Northern Iowa game. I mean, on in, in their first drive of the game, they just marched down the field, and they had to settle for a field goal. But it's just like, at the beginning of some of these games, the defense just can't get off the field. And... 
it's not until later in the game when they finally figure it out. And this has kind of been, and this is on both sides of the field, this team just always kind of starts off slow. Like, when's the last time this team came out of the gates and you're like, wow, that was the Colorado game? Yep. that was It was the Colorado game. No other game have they come out of the gates and you were just like, wow, this team is playing great in all phases right out of the gates. The, the offense played good to start against the Illinois game in the Illinois game. But, but the defense didn't look good. And then the Ohio State game, the defense started out strong, but the offense didn't. I mean, the, one, the, the one game where both sides of the ball came to play right from the start was the Colorado game. No other game did, did they do that. I mean, I'm going to take UTEP out. I mean, that just doesn't even Utah, count. Yeah, UTEP and UNI don't count. Even in the UNI game, the defense didn't come out to play right away. No. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just it, it's the, the slow starts, and it seems like you're just always having to crawl and scrap. And it, it's just, yeah, the, the slow starts. And every coach wants to say, oh, we want to start out strong. Well, obviously you want to start out strong. But this team just doesn't seem prepared out of the gates. This is where I think the one thing I really don't like about what with Matt Rule's coach speak and his philosophy speak is, and I'm not quoting this directly, but you'll get the gist, is that he wants them to be stronger in the fourth quarter than the first quarter. He wants them to finish stronger than how they started. Yeah. Well, why aren't you starting strong in the first place? Yeah. Like, two drives of over six and a half minutes from your opponent, and you're not even out on the field on offense for two minutes, Mm -hmm. and you just look completely out of sorts, it's just, it's not okay. It's, it's, that's not what, yeah, that's not how Big Ten football works. (laughs) And I, Brian Buschini got asked this after the game, and by the way, if your punter's getting asked to do post-game availability... That's nothing against Buscini, but something's yeah. not exactly right here. But yeah, anyway. No, yeah, no one said that. I was kind of thinking it. When yeah, I was thinking it too. But anyway, um, where where my issue lies with it is this This is Big Ten football. And Buscini equated it to a miniature version of the NFL, which I thought was a little strange at first. But then when I went and thought about it, I was like, okay. This is a very defensive game. You have to find ways to push through on offense, and you have to be able to hold your own. Mm-hmm. And the pretense to that question was kind of to that answer was kind of weird because it was like punter's life in the Big Ten type deal. But I was a little, I was surprised at first by the answer, but then I realized like this, it kind of makes sense. You have to, it's this is a very defensive brand especially when you get away from like the top four or five teams who can just sling the ball around and beat you that way and still have a good defense Oregon's the only team that can really do that typically that's what it's been but this this year it is or it's just Oregon but especially for middle of the pack teams like this you have to be able to play a good defense or it's to play play good defense or you're not going to be able to really survive and like you've been saying Brassett just couldn't get off the field at the beginning of the game. Uh, right. And, and, and UCLA took advantage of it. And by no means, the defense didn't play amazing in the game. But that that's not, the defensive side of the ball is not why this team, why they lost. No. I mean, yeah, you could say, oh, UCLA scored 27. Well, one of those was a pick six. Um, So that, I mean, you don't count that against the defense. So they really gave up 20. And if you would have said, coming into the game, Nebraska gave up 20, you'd have been like, uh, it's a little bit more you would have wanted, but you still be like, okay, you should still probably win that game, right? Yep. But they didn't because the offense was not – they just didn't start out great. And, I mean, this was kind of expected, though, UCLA. I mean, I my bold take was UCLA takes an early 10-0 to lead. They did. And, and they did. And I thought Nebraska would then respond and not give up anymore. I said they'd score 21 straight. That didn't happen, but – I mean, I, it was kind of expected that this team would, would start out strong. I mean, they have Eric Bieniemy as their offensive coordinator. This guy coached in the NFL as the offensive coordinator for one of the best teams in the league with Patrick Mahomes as his quarterback. Like, like he was the offensive coordinator for that team. He coached under Andy Reid. And I'm not saying, like, he's not Andy Reid, obviously, or he wouldn't be coaching college football right now. But he knows what he's doing. Like, he's a seasoned coach. He knows what he's doing. And, yeah, Tony White got schooled a little bit at the beginning of the game, but— they Tony White made adjustments. 
They figured it out. Like, you you knew UCLA was going to be able to do some stuff on offense. Like, this was, like, Eric Bieniemy knows what he's doing. There's some talent on this offense. Like, you knew that Nebraska wasn't going to just come in and hold them to zero points. Like, that um, wasn't going to be the case. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, this was, it was a coaching battle. And Tony White got the better of it in the second half. It's just, you, the, I mean, the pick six is what really set this team back. If Nebraska doesn't throw that pick six, the, 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 I mean, Nebraska, the, this game probably goes to overtime, which we know overtime games go for Nebraska. But it, It's interesting that you bring that up, though, with the pick six, and I wanted to get to it at, at some point as well. Yeah, the pick six was not good. It was, I think, 38 yards on the return, something like that. I'd have to look. Something it, like that. So, something along It was the first lines. play from scrimmage. It was, it was the first play of the second half, but... It was, it was something along those 38 yards. That's wow, it was right on the money. But it was 38 yards, but it should never have been a pick six. Like Kane Madrano just, and he got a lot of good blocks from his convoy, but it just didn't seem like there was any effort there from Nebraska to try and stop. Him. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, when the defense picks it off like that, you had a lot of wide receivers downfield. Now, who, so when, the defense gets a pick. Who's going to make the tackle? You have five offensive linemen that aren't going to be able to catch that guy. That just aren't going to be able to tackle him. You have a quarterback that really doesn't have very much interest in wanting to bring him down. Because, I mean, he's the quarterback. So, you really have... that's You're down six guys. So, you really only have five guys out there that can make that, can make that tackle. Like, the running back, the receivers, and then, like, the tight end. You already had your tight end and a few receivers already behind him because you had them going deep. So there was really only like two guys that could really bring him down there in Rayola, which we all know. I mean, Rayola didn't bring him down. He he whiffed on him. That that's why. I mean, and you know they had all those blockers. I mean, it, it's just it was kind of one of those plays when you throw something over the middle. That's when that's when you get into dangerous territory because you have receivers too far downfield. Offensive linemen really can't make that tackle because they're not going to be able to catch him. And then, I mean, they really only had like two or three guys that could make that tackle and they all got blocked. I'm not I'm not upset about the fact that the pick six ha- – well, I am upset that the pick six happened. Sh- shouldn't have happened in the first place. But what irks me more is just you might not be able to catch him, but at least look like you're interested in the play. I mean, like, they, that's, that's – I, I don't think that was an effort. That's what bothered me a little bit. I didn't think that there was much of an effort – deal with that i just think i just think it's really hard to bring him down in that like in in that scenario it's hard to bring him down because you just you don't there's just not many guys on the field that can make that tackle i mean really you only have five guys in the field that can make that tackle because rayola can't and your five offensive linemen can't so you really only have five guys that make that tackle and two or three of them were behind the guys guys because they're out there running that that's why it's just it's just you're you're in a bad spot. Like I mean, even though in the last game when Ohio State threw that interception, the, I mean, the, they, Nebraska Hartsog almost got that all the way because when you throw an interception over the middle of the field and you have guys downfield, there's just not many guys that can make that tackle. Now Hartsog went down the sideline and they were able to get him pushed out, but if he would have stayed more towards the middle of the field, he probably gets in because there's nobody really that can make that tackle. They just can't. Like, it's really, when you throw an interception over the middle of the field, it's tough for the offense to bring them down. One more thing on quarterbacks I think we should get to, because we were discussing this during the game. As you probably know, Dylan Royal had to leave the game due to an injury, try to come back, couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Heinrich Harburg finished out the game. Mm-hmm. We had been talking about during the game, and this is going to lead into something else, but talking about a quarterback change. I think it was very drastic of us to think about that in the moment and the and the ripple effects that would have happened would be a little crazy. But we did get a chance to see Heinrich Harburg playing an extended run at quarterback, mm-hmm. however however you want to put that. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to to br- maybe just for like one silver lining from this game is that Heinrich Harburg looks a lot better at that position than he did last year. Yeah, didn't have a whole lot of opportunities, but he he looked yeah he looked fine. I I'm still. How do I want to put this? Rayola's the better quarterback. 
I don't think there's any denying that Rayo is a more talented quarterback because he is. Throughout, like Rayo's arm is way better. I think the way he, I don't want to say read defenses, but just the talent. He has more talent. But the problem is that Rayo doesn't run the ball, and I go back to last year, and obviously we don't want last year's offense either. Last year's offense was not great. But you want to know what the one thing that last year's offense could do? It was run the ball. And why could they run the ball? That you have you have basically the same offensive line. It's a little banged up, but pretty much the same offensive line, same backfield. Like Dowdell's not any more talented than I don't know, Emmett Johnson was last year, really. Maybe a little bit better. Like you pretty much have the same offensive bit. line and same backfield. What's the difference? It's the quarterback that the quarterback can't run. That is why the run game, the run game is not great. And the passing game wasn't great last year, but all you could also attribute that to the wide receiver room that was already not very talented was banged up. And Heinrich Harburg was probably not expected to play quarterback last year. Yeah. and Who's yes. a tight end by trade. I mean, that's just the whole thing. Now, if you, if you would have brought Harburg into the game, and I'm not even— I don't disagree with them not playing Harburg because— this is just such a hard conversation because Rayo is the future of this team. Like, yes. right now, he's, yep. the fu- he's the future of this team. No, absolutely. If, if he doesn't leave, he's the future of this team. Harburg is not the future of the team. So you're trying to balance winning right now or trying to set you up for success down the road. Like, that's kind of the balance, the tricky balance you're putting in. But let's say they would have brought in Harburg. The running game would have been better it, it just is because when the defense has to account for the quarterback run it just makes it so much tougher why could nebraska not stop the run against indiana but they could against ohio state why danny why it was because indiana's quarterback could run a little bit mm-hmm. will howard doesn't run the ball ever and the few times he did bring it, I mean, he like the one time he had open field, he, he tripped trying to go. He pulled a Daniel Jones. I mean, that's why. When, the, when yeah. you don't have on those RPOs, when you don't even have to think about the quarterback keeping it and taking off, you don't even have to think about that. It's, it's a lot easier to, to defend the run game because you know the running back is going to get it. Yep. Like that is the difference. India Rourke, not the best running quarterback ever by any means but he could run it a little bit and it made the defense have to think about that now there's other reasons why indiana could run the ball but my simplified version is that when you don't have a quarterback that can run the ball it just makes it so much tougher it's so much tougher and we know rayola can do it but as we saw in the game you don't want him to get hurt because again he's the future of your team so again they're trying to balance winning right now and winning in the future this is this is the whole thing They're trying to balance two different timelines right now, and it's just making it really tough, especially on the offense. Defense, that's not as big of a deal. I'm talking about the offense. What is this offense trying to do? Because if you bring Harburg in, you probably have a better chance to win that game. I mean, probably. I mean, I'm just going to flat out say that if you had Har, like, if you'd have brought Harburg in, in that, I'm trying to think of when I first started thinking about that. I don't know if it was the end of the first half or beginning of the second half. I think it was after the pick six, shortly yes. after that. I think it was the drive after the pick six. If you bring in Harburg there and you just solely rely on the run game and you have a little bit of passing game, you probably have more success. I bet I bet they put I bet they punch it in on the goal line when they had that first when when they got to the red zone first time in that second half. I bet they punch it in. They wouldn't have thrown it and and we can now go into play calling, but that that's a cool thing. They're trying to balance two timelines, and it's just really tough. But it was. But before we do that, I just wanted to say that it was good to see Harburg like looking comfortable back there. Yes, like he he actually looked like uh, a competent quarterback for for as much as that's Thro- worth. Throwing the ball, throwing throwing the ball. Yes, throwing the ball. We all know we could run him. Right. He looked like a guy that just didn't wasn't just thrust in there mm-hmm. because of ball security issues and. I feel a lot better now now that we actually got to see it. Part of me in the back of my head was like, okay, what happens if Rayola gets hurt? How is Harbor going to look just because we haven't seen a ton of him since Rayola got here? Mm-hmm. And even though we only went two for seven, 
and did have the game ending interception. That was more on Banks than him. Yes. Or it was, no, it was Barney that um kicked the ball in the air. Okay. But anyway, um he he just he he looked a lot more comfortable back there. Now since he had a year under his belt and he actually he had people he could throw to for as much as that's worth. But I now feel better about Rayola's backups no matter what happens to him because he actually got thrust into that situation where Rayola couldn't play the rest of the game because of an injury. And he looked fine. Yeah, he looked he looked fine. Now, Harburg's not going to be able to make the downfield plays that Rayola's going to be able to make. But Nebraska's not making enough of those downfield plays to justify not having a run game right now. And we can now go into this because the run game was actually fine against UCLA. The run game was fine. It wasn't great, but it was good enough where if Nebraska would have leaned on that run game more, and especially earlier in the game, this game's probably closer and Nebraska probably wins. Like, Nebraska, and, and, I, and this is one of my takeaways, Nebraska's offense does not have an identity. They have no identity. There is nothing that this team, this offense, can lean back on when all else fails, we're going to do this. This offense doesn't have that. No. Like last year, all else fails, we're going to run some option with the quarterback. We're going to have a quarterback run that's probably going to do pretty decent. Like when all else failed, they were just going to run run at you. Nebraska doesn't have, like, they, they don't trust their run game to do that. They don't really trust anything. They don't. They don't trust the receivers to go and make plays. And this is probably based on earlier in the year when there was two interceptions that happened because the receiver got the ball ripped out of his hands in the air. And then Rayola has been throwing interceptions recently. He threw three against Indiana, one against Ohio State, and then he threw the one against UCLA. Like He's been throwing quite a bit of interceptions. And at the wrong times. And then all, yeah, I mean... It just seems like this this offense doesn't have anything to lean back on. They don't have an identity. And the philosophy behind this offense right now seems to be, and I also wrote this, the offense seems to be trying to pass the ball to set up the run game when it should be run the ball to set up the pass game. Especially in this Big Ten. Like, in the Big Ten, you run the ball to set up the play-action pass game. That is what you do. Nebraska is trying to do it the other way. And that is why this offense is struggling so much. That's why they're struggling because they they don't they they once they start finally started relying on the run game in the second half, the uh, Rayola had more time. I mean, the, the he had a better time throwing the ball because the defense was like, oh, they're running the ball effectively right now. They're not running it amazingly, but if they would have ran it three times, they were getting enough yards to get a first down. They were getting like three and a half to four yards. Yeah, about. I mean, they they were like. They, you have to rely on the run in this league in the Big Ten. You have to be able to run the ball. You just have to be. UCLA doesn't run the ball. They were UCLA was dead last running the ball coming into this game, dead last in the country, and they put up over a hundred rushing yards on you. One hundred and thirty nine to be exact. Because they knew in this league against this Nebraska team, you were going to have to be able to run the ball to set up your passing game. You have to be able to do that, and they did it. They did it more effectively than Nebraska did. And again, this goes back to a coaching thing. That Players don't go out there and, and say, we're going to set up the passing game. We're going to use the passing game to set up the running game. Players aren't doing that. This isn't the NFL. That, 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 this is coaching. And I now want to go to play calling because it just seems like this team would not rely on the run game. Run the ball. You, on your drive, when you got to the red zone— and went for on fourth down and didn't get it, so you came up empty in the red zone. You ran the ball all drive long to get to get it down to their 10-yard line, first and 10. Ran the ball that entire drive to get to that. You then run the ball on first down, get five yards. Okay? It's second and five. Okay, it was first and 10 from UCLA's 10-yard line. You run a ball, five yards, second and five. What do you then do? You pass the ball three straight times. Three straight times, Danny. Two incomplete, one time he got sacked. This is the thing where I don't understand, as a play caller, 
You just saw on first and 10 that you got five yards rushing the ball, running the ball. If you can get, if you are in the red zone and you run the ball and you get five yards, you are ecstatic. Because that field is shrunk and it makes running the ball tough. But you got five yards running the ball there. That's really good in the red zone. Why do you not lean on that? You have your your best running back on the roster right now, the guy you gave 17 carries to, which it should have been more, but you gave 17 carries to, Dowdell, what is he? He's a power running back. Where does he thrive the most in? The red zone. Give him the ball in the red zone. Get, get, this get, this give, isn't that hard. Get, give him the ball in the red zone. What did they do their second red zone opportunity in the second half when they did score? They ran the ball every time. They ran, they ran the ball every time. They were giving the ball to Dowdell, Emma Johnson. They were just running the ball. And they punched it in. They punched it in. Like, it, it just doesn't. It, it. I just don't feel like it's that complicated. Like in the red zone, like just just run the ball. Like this team is trying. Like this this offense, this team is just trying to do too much right now. Especially when they get to the red zone, because some I feel like they do fine. Not always, but like Nebraska is able to sustain some drives, and then the red zone they just stall out because they're trying to do too much. If you really want to talk about just how much Nebraska gets in their own way, because they do a lot, they overthink everything, and they they try to do too much. Nebraska had three scoring drives on Saturday. All three of those scoring drives probably should not have happened. UCLA got in their own way. Nebraska was able to extend those drives on unsportsmanlike conduct penalties. Those were automatic first downs. Ever each one of them. And they got bailed out by UCLA running their mouths and having antics. And the officials caught them three times. Three three unsportsmanlike penalties. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Nebraska was able to take advantage of that. But the preceding play leading up to those unsportsmanlike penalties should have gotten them off the field. And correct me if I'm yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but all three of them happened on third down plays yeah. when UCLA was that close to getting off the field. They do mm -hmm. something dumb, and it keeps the drive going. And this is kind of another thing where I don't think UCLA was doing it on purpose. Like you obviously don't want to be getting penalties on purpose, but I think the idea was to show that they were the more physical team. Like, they wanted to show that they had more energy, more they, physical. They looked, they looked like they wanted to be there. And that was the idea with these unsportsmanlike penalties, was get in their head. Like, I, I, tru I truly believe that. You don't get three unsportsmanlike penalties just out of the blue. Like that, it, it, it just doesn't happen. Once, sure. Usually when it happens one time, the coach yells at the entire team, and then they get their ducks in a row and it doesn't happen again it happened three times three times it's that that was on purpose like that was something that was drilled into this team's head I, and i'm just completely spitballing here but i i feel very confident in this is that they were just they were just trying to get into brassica's head and it worked it absolutely worked and but again it, it goes to show that the, <laughs> the drive shouldn't have happened and a lot of that goes back to play calling just not being smart. But it also goes down to execution. But I put that more on the coaching staff, and I'm glad we're finally getting into this because I think this is <laughs> – but the, this has been the storyline, though, is that Nebraska did not look prepared. It looked a lot like it did against Indiana. And if you really want to make your stomach churn – it looked a lot like it did when Nebraska went to East Lansing last year. It it struck because I was at that game, and as I was watching Saturday's game progress, all I can remember seeing is just exactly what was transpiring at Michigan State last year, because that's exactly what it was. Just and, and Michigan State last year, even though they weren't that good was probably a better team than UCLA was this season. And the same thing happened again. No one really looked like they wanted to be there. No one in the stands looked like they wanted to be there. I mean, 
some other people in the press box were commenting about just like how quiet it was out there. And UCLA had a lot to do with that, but the energy was never there from the start. We know how much players feed off of the crowd support. The crowd support was not there. You want to know why? And and, and Oh, I, please tell me. And I was just scrolling through Twitter while you were talking there. Oh, Thumb Warrior. And I saw a former player, not going to say his name because I'm just not going to say it, who, tweet, who tweeted about he wasn't blaming fans, but he was disappointed the lack of energy in the stadium. That, like, this is basically his entire thread where it's like, you're down, like, we have people leaving at halftime when it's 13 to 7. I think I saw this thread too. So, my my rebuttal to that is going to be, it's really hard as a fan when, especially for me, okay? If, if I, I, so, I, I am 20 years old, okay? Happy birthday. <laughs> it's not my birthday. <laughs> my birthday's in May. I, I'm 20 years old, okay? Nebraska hasn't made a bowl game since 2016, okay? That was eight years ago. I was 12. Okay, I, I was 12. 11, I think. I was 12. I was like, I wasn't even. I watched Nebraska, but I was 12 years old. I couldn't comprehend the game like I can now. I wasn't invested into it like I am now. I, I just wasn't. You go back even further. When, when the last time we won a national championship, that was before we were born. We, we weren't even on this planet the last time this team won a national championship. That was 97, right? Yeah. We weren't even on. We weren't even on. I wasn't even a thought. We weren't even on this planet. And the last time they had a meaningful like game where this team was on the national stage was that what was, it was two thousand eight the two thousand eight Big Twelve championship game against Texas when Sue had that incredible game. Two thousand if that was two thousand eight, I was four. Okay, I didn't watch that game. I don't remember that game. I was four years old. It'd be kind of cool if you remember that. Game I was probably eating crackers upstairs <laughs> and not even watching the game at all. Like how? So we have never. Especially students. Like so so he was like talking about the student section, this former player. Student section was leaving. Nobody in that student section has ever seen this team do anything productive on a national stage. Never. Never. Like and then to start that game, your defense can't get off the field. Well, UCLA has like a seven minute drive and get a field goal, okay? Your offense then goes three and out, minute and a half. Looked incompetent for first drive of the game. Your opening drive to start the game, this is what you prepared for the entire week. Your offense did absolutely nothing on the first drive of the game. You then punt it, and they go. their offense goes as the exact same thing. Drives down over six minutes, gets a touchdown. You're down 10-0. to zero. After the, It is the start of the second quarter. You're down 10-0, to zero, and your offense has gotten one drive that went for a minute and a half. And we're about and, 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 a third and, of the way through the second quarter? And... About. And... Why, why, why would the fans be ecstatic at that? Like what? How? Do, like that is how you get draw the energy out of a crowd. Is your team over and over and over and over again comes up short? Your defense comes up short on third down over and over and over and over again. And your offense had three plays that that went for two yards that went a minute and a half. What? That is why the the crowd had no energy. And then. Your offense looks terrible the rest of the first half. You're down 13 to 7. By some miracle, you're only down 13 to 7. Like if you were just watching that game, you would have thought UCLA was up by two or three scores. They Easily. were only down. Yeah, you they, Easily. But Nebraska was only down by one. Then, okay, come out of the second half. Let's see what they do out of the second half. The first play from scrimmage, they throw a pick six. Pick six, 20 to 7. The offense then continues to do nothing. And I don't know if it was one or two drives later, UCLA, on a blown coverage, throws a bomb down the field. It is now, what, 20? It was then 27-7. to 27-7. to 7. I saw that fans was, that was on, pouring out of the stadium. That was on UCLA's first drive of the third quarter. Okay, so that was the first drive. So so Nebraska had the pick six. Then they had their next then they, drive. Then they had the three and out. And then they punted to UCLA, and they go was, back that down was, the score. That was not a three and out. They That was... Um, they turned that one over on downs. Oh, that was the turnover on downs? Okay. Yep, first turnover on downs. But still, like... Surprisingly, they didn't have a three and out in the second half. The, this... And this is just, like, entitlement. 
like if you like is this how the players is this how the players think like on the team right now like the players are disappointed that the fans aren't on their feet screaming when your team is down 27 to 7 on your home field against a 2 and 5 team like it, it, like i genuinely want to know if this is what the coaches and players think like my rule said post game if i was a fan in the sta- stadium i would have been mad too there this team has done nothing in my entire lifetime to think, oh, they're going to do it. This, this this is the year. This is the game that they're going to do it. They're going to come back 27-7 to and win this game. No. No one was thinking that. No one was thinking that. And the fact that you can blame – I mean, he wasn't blaming the fan base for why they lost the game. But the fact that you could be mad at a fan base for not having energy – for a team that has the longest bull, sh- bull, bull drought streak in all power power four schools, you have, like no 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 school has has gone this long without making a bowl game. Twenty sixteen, eight years. You haven't made a bowl game in eight years. Now all you have to do is get the six wins to do that. Haven't done that. Your team hasn't been nationally relevant in pretty much my almost my entire lifetime since I can even remember. What? You should be ecstatic that that stadium is still sold out every single game. This is the most loyal fan base I have ever seen. What other college, if Ohio State would go eight straight years not making a bowl game, haven't made it to a national championship or a conference championship since 20, 2008, you think their stadium would be sold out? You think their stadium would be sold out, Danny? Absolutely not. No. Do you think their fans would be listening to every Husker football podcast the day after and the week following after a loss to a 2-5 and five UCLA team? Uh, no. No. They would stop caring. You want to know what there would be? There'd be apathy. There'd be apathy. You just don't care anymore. And that's why the season was so important. And even though, at least me personally, I'm relatively new to the nebraska fan landscape and the lore and all that Mm -hmm. just because i haven't been here very long but even i recognized that especially last season that this year and maybe next year too depending on what happens but this could be the last chance that the nebraska athletic department has to save this football program because of the glory years under Tom Osborne, which are now, you know, are becoming further and further and further away. And this team, like you said, has been nationally relevant in 16, 17 years, something like that, a really long time. People's patience wears out. And like you said, students that go to this university have not seen a winning football program their entire time here. This team hasn't made a postseason game. Not just here, in their lifetime. It, it, right, and they're also... Uh, we, we grew up in the Bo Puini era when we get eight or nine wins. Okay, great. You still, like, you weren't nationally relevant. You, even, couldn't, you couldn't beat any top-ranked teams. But, but I'm saying specifically that while university students have been here, specifically at this institution, they've not seen a winning football program. And thank God for some of the other sports teams that are at this school that have actually kept interest in the university afloat. Like, just imagine it. Imagine here for a second if Nebraska volleyball was not as good as they were. Imagine if they hadn't gone and made their historic run to the national title game. Imagine if they hadn't been like as nationally relevant as they are. And they were one of the and they were not very good either just imagine what that would spell for this athletic department because they have been their saving grace for probably the last 15 years you go i mean remember the remember the video my rule posted on on social media when he said it's our turn after You're, after trev left or whatever i, I think that's one of, i think that's one that was so your volleyball team is one of the most storied it's probably the most storied program in all of volleyball. Nobody cares about volleyball as much as Nebraska cares about volleyball. Nobody does. Nope. 
you had your soccer team last year make it all the way to the Elite Eight. Elite Eight, yep. Elite Eight. Your baseball team won the Big Ten Championship. Track team won Big Ten Championships. Men's basketball got to the NCAA tournament. Your women's team won a game. Women's basketball team won a game in the NCAA tournament. Softball wasn't great. But they but brought in the best player in they the brought, sport. They brought in the b- best player in the sport. Now, Nebraska kind of had something similar with that with Dylan Rayle, but still. <laughs> like every. But at least Jordy Ball's been proven. Every program has been going in the right direction, kind of. Now, soccer's not as great this year. They didn't, yeah, they didn't play that well this year. But still, like every. I mean, and Matt Rule said, it's our turn. It's our turn. And it's just funny because, I mean, I don't think fans are at, like, yes, some fans are asking. I don't think fans are asking, though, major, like the majority of them are not asking this team to even be Ohio, to even like be a top five ranked team nationally. They just want a product out there that they can be proud of. Really? No, absolutely. They just want a product that they can be proud of. There is nothing to be proud of after that Indiana game. There's nothing to be proud of as a if you're a Husker fan after this UCLA game. You, I mean, and you could say there's no moral victories, but at least in that Ohio State game, Nebraska played the number four team in the nation to the final minute, final drive of the game. You still had a chance to win that game. You then go the week after you have UCLA here. I don't know how a team goes from going to Ohio State and you almost beat the number four team in the nation to welcoming a two and five UCLA team. And just right from the start, the game looked like you were going to lose. You were down 27 to seven at one point. Like, how does that even happen? Like that doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't. And before we get to more coaching stuff, this, like I said, if things do not work out under Matt rule, and maybe this is really going to irk some people, but I don't care saying it, that sellout streak is going to end. I I don't feel good about the stands continuing to fill up. I'm Again, probably the most – it is the most loyal fan base in college sports. Now, I don't know – I'm going to say this, though. I don't think that would ever happen. I got to be honest because – Okay, that's fine. One – like I, I truly believe it would have to take like another ten years of not making a bowl game, being I mean the product on the field just not being great for that to even start to happen. Like we're not there yet. Like Nebraska's not okay. there yet. You have you have. That's why I said it was probably a little far fetched. You, you have companies like th- th- there's companies that buy these seats to make sure the sellout streak continues. Like it's not all fans. Like. You, you get what I mean. But what I'm saying is, like, the attendance that shows up to the games. It'll start to like, win. It, it's going to start to go down. It's going to it's gonna win. And I remember last last year especially, and where especially with the students, there was not a lot of people there. It The, the South Stadium especially, because you can see everyone who's in South Stadium, it was not filled. Mm-mm. For the most part this year... And save for yesterday, but the first five home games of the season, it was filled. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people in there. That was not exactly the case yesterday. It wasn't like completely empty, but it wasn't totally packed either. Like there was some, there was some empty spots, but as the game progressed, more and more people started to leave. And it looked a lot like it did last year, and it looked it's looked a lot like it has in years past. Yeah, and and I go back to the former player's tweet when he saw students leaving at halftime, and he was saying, "Are you coming back?" And they said, "No. Why would we come back?" And he's like, "Well, maybe because your team's only down one score in a huge game. Um, maybe it's because this is same story, different chapter." Here we go again. This like you like you knew. Nebraska was going to be able to come back in that game and make it interesting because Nebraska always makes it interesting, Danny. They, they're they going to make you stay glued to that TV. Outside of that Indiana game that was just complete and ugly, Nebraska, for the most part, knows how to keep a fan interested. 
Now, this isn't by design. I love how you looked. You like put your arm on the but table and just like looked all philosophical. They, like they that. Nebraska <laughs> always knows how to keep fans in the game until the very end of the game when they break their hearts. And Husker fans think every time maybe this is the, maybe this is the game where Nebraska finally comes up on top and, and they by some miracle they win the game. Maybe this is finally the game. Maybe it's this one, Danny. The next week, it'll be the same thing. I bet the USC game is pretty close. I bet by the fourth quarter, it's a one-score game. But it's going to be the same story, different page, different chapter, because Nebraska, in the end, always falls up short. Go back to last year. Every single one of those games in November. Three-score or three-point games, I think, something like that? Yes. Like, I mean, Nebraska, no one knows how to lose close games like Nebraska knows how to lose close games. And and it's a coaching thing. That is all coaching. Oh, let's go to that. It's all, Danny, it's all coaching. And I think Rule would agree that it's all coaching. This is not a talent issue. And I said that Nebraska has had a top, what, 30 recruiting class? Yep. Like every year. That means this should be a top 30 team. And right? on top of that, and on top of that, you have the facilities and the fan base and the money mm-hmm. that a lot of other programs would dream to have. Mm-hmm. Like you can, I don't know many, especially Big Ten schools outside of Oregon, Ohio State, Michigan, that have stuff like the Osborne Legacy Complex. Mm-hmm. You might find a lot of that in the SEC. But definitely not in the Big Ten, definitely not in the Big 12, definitely not in the ACC. Mm-hmm. You're not finding that there. Nebraska, for Nebraska, they're the only school in the state that anyone cares about. And they're the professional only professional and you know. right. And for some surrounding states, they're also getting some feed from that as well. Mm-hmm. I I can't Im- I'm sure that there's plenty of people living in like South Dakota, Wyoming, North Dakota that have investments in Nebraska and are not as invested in North Dakota State, South Dakota State, Wyoming, the other North Dakota, South Dakota, those schools. And then they're more invested in Nebraska because of the brand. Like you have a nationally recognized brand, maybe even internationally. And I think it helped when they went to, it was Ireland two years ago, right? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. I couldn't, was blanking on where that, it was. That, wait, didn't they not go, wasn't the Ireland game like during the Scott Frost era? That, yeah, that, that was, was in, more than two years ago. That was, so maybe it was like 2021 then, I think. Yeah, when they lost to Northwestern. Yep. But any, but, kick. yes, that. But you went overseas. You have, you're now trying to build a brand there. Everyone knows exactly what that N is. And what that end stands for. The fact that it's been as long as it has. I'm not even talking about national championship at this point. I'm not even talking about national relevance. I'm talking about getting to six wins. The fact that you still can't get to six wins with all of the gobs of money that are coming in. And people willing to donate to your athletic department and your NIL collective. And the fact that it's one of the only freestanding athletic departments in the entire country. They don't take money from the students. They don't take money from the state. They're supporting themselves. And the fact that you still can't put a competent team together on the field is really damning of your culture. And guess where that starts? From the top. Now, we're talking about this last night after the game was over. In no way, in no way, Am I saying that Matt Rule needs to be gone after the year's over? Because that is completely off base. Most of the time, for for any head coach, you need to you probably should be evaluating between like years two and three. No, a coach should get three years. A coach should, unless something egregious happens. Right. So Rule's going to be here next year, no matter what. Hmm. But yeah, <laughs> you laugh at that now, but. No, I mean yes, he'll be here. He, I mean, he, I mean, if Nebraska would get blown out in each of the next games, like really bad, like Indiana bad, he'd probably get fired. But but that's not going to probably happen. But anyway, there needs to be some serious looking within at this coaching staff, specifically on the offensive side. And I'm going to 
And if you really want to get specific, Coach Satterfield and Coach Thomas, the two offensive coordinators. Thomas is the co-offensive coordinator to Marcus Satterfield. Matt Rule, by by trade, is more of a defensive-minded guy. Mm -hmm. That's fine. When you're hiring an offensive coordinator, what you basically have to be looking for is someone who's basically going to be the head coach of your offense. Mm-hmm. Okay? Marcus Satterfield, yeah, and a lot of it's also a loyalty hire because Satterfield's been with Matt Rule since he was at Temple. Coached with him at Temple, coached him with Baylor, now he's coaching with him here. Yeah, you guys have a history together, but Marcus Satterfield was not a play caller at South Carolina. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is Satterfield's first play calling job. Yes? Pretty sure. Okay. So let's go on that basis. This is Satterfield's first play calling job. You mean to tell me that, yeah, you might trust him with your life and then some, but you mean to tell me when you're trying to bring a program back from the dead that you're going to put your trust in a guy, yes, you've worked with him for 15, 16 years, however long that rule's been around, you're telling me you're going to put a trust in a guy that's never called plays before. That's what – it it irritated me a little bit when, when the hire happened, and it irritates me more now because we're starting to see just how much it has impacted the team. Um. So before you go any further, um, I just want to say that all this talk and all this rhetoric is going to go away if Nebraska wins one more. Well, some people, I'm not letting it go away. I, I, I want to say that if they get one more win, um, I would guess that Satterfield would probably be back next year. I'm gonna guess that. I think. Okay. I think what would happen? Is no, I could totally the, see the, that. The talk is though, like if Nebraska wins two out of the next three, I'm not saying that's gonna happen. I don't see that happening. At most, they win one more. But if Nebraska, let's say by some miracle, they win two out of the next three. Is Satterfield going to be gone? No, he won't be gone. Um, and some people f- calling for an in-season fire. That's a little off base. That see, it's 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 not. That's not something I, you can do at the college ranks. Really, it, even it, at any rank, it, it you can. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it, but we, we, we've seen it. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge culture shift, though. It's a huge I'm, culture I'm not shift, for it. and it's kind of. I don't want to say it's throwing in the towel, but it's kind of like admitting this isn't like there's something completely wrong in the middle of the season. And I think the only time a coach should be fired middle of the season is if the players have stopped like caring. Like the like you lost your players. Like you lost your locker room. Like you know what I mean? Like the only time a coach should be fired is if you if he is if he lost the locker room or they do something egregious. Like Purdue has like like Purdue lost locker room. Like the team just doesn't care anymore. They had to make a change. They had to do something. Like the team yeah. was just they weren't even being competitive. This team is competitive. Like this team, like these players are going out there and they're trying their hardest. And so I like they're not gonna fire anybody middle season, especially the fact because of the fact that this team is five and four right now and they could still easily win one more and get to a bowl game and then a lot of this hateful talk hate rhetoric like here we go again rhetoric is going to kind of die down a little bit but yeah i mean after this season if let's say this team does miss a bowl game they they they, they go five and seven lose their last five what they that It'd means be they six lose in last, a row they'd lose six in a row yeah rule's gonna have to start cleaning house like and, and that's not like that's not off base for anybody to say it. like he like he's gonna have to clean house this is going to be two seasons in a row where you went five and seven, so that means you're going to be ten and ten and twelve, ten and fourteen in your first two years. That that's not great. Ten and fourteen is not good in your first two years. It's just not good because you want to see incremental improvement. And right now you don't see improvement. Honestly, like it don't. almost looks like it's a step, a bit of a step back. I mean, th- this is very similar to the Michigan State loss last yep. year. It's very, very similar. And that is why this here we go again talk is kind of really like it's at the precipice right now. It's getting and, louder. Oh, it's so loud. It's it's so loud, Danny. Like, remember when I said we were talking about the flagpole and the red flag? Is it is it That's at the top? A, I love that analogy that we made up. It's 
And is the sky falling? We said after the Indiana game, is the sky falling? No. The sky's not falling. But it was a cool it was it was a shake in the foundation that Rule was trying trying to build. And the flag was going up. And you were trying to decide whether, okay, is this a blip or is this a sign of things to come? Then the Ohio State game happened, and Rule starts talking about this championship mindset. And you could see the championship mindset on the field. Like you saw it. From the players, you saw it. Especially on the defensive side of the ball, like you saw a championship mindset out there. You did. Like I'm I'm not even gonna deny that. Like you did. You were you were you weren't happy with the result, but you were kind of but that was a product that you were proud of. Like like Husker fans were proud of the product that got put out there. Would you say? Barring the end of the game, but yes, I'd say so. I think they were proud of the product that got put out there. Against the in this game, you're not proud of the product that got put out there. And again, that the, the sky like that that sky is falling rhetoric, it's very loud right now. And it's very real. Like it's real. Where, like as we like as we sit right the flag is all the way at the top of the thing. It's all Thank the way you at, for it, it's all that. the way at the top. Yeah. Like the sky, like right now, like if you had just watched Rules post game, it doesn't look like the sky's falling. He's very calm and collected right now. But in the back of his mind, in the back of everyone's minds, and Husker fans are saying it very loudly and openly on social media and just by seeing people leaving the stands at halftime in the beginning of the third quarter, the sky is falling. Like, they, like this team, it is very, like, it is more likely than not that this team doesn't win another game. Ben, I remember sitting in that press conference room after the game with you last night. We all had the same thought in the back of our heads. No one was going to sit there and say it because we we all try and stay away from the bad as much as we can. And that's kind of human nature. But we all knew it. We saw the look on Rule's face. At least I did. And I read it to me as like, this dude is like, he's not feeling good about things right now. I mean, who would after what they've gone through? But that's just Rule's nature. He's not going to stand up there and start throwing people under the bus. That's that's just how he is. And I I admire him for that. Not a lot of people can see, do that. See, th- this is the thing is that Rule's saying is, all, is saying all the right things. Oh, absolutely. He's saying all, I mean... But it's a lot not, of coach speak, though. Not all the time is he saying all the right things, and there's sometimes I question what he says. But for the most part, for the most part, he, is. he says the things that hits the right poles for this fan base. Like after that Ohio State game, fans were like they loved what he said post game. Fans loved what he said post game against Ohio State. But now you're kind of it, it's kind of words and no action. That's kind of what you're seeing right now. Like like there's just not action. Like, you talk about wanting to build a championship program, but you're not willing to do the things to make this a championship program. Like, you're not willing to make the moves. You're not willing to make the sacrifices. You're not willing to put this team in the right mindset to go out there and have a championship product out there. Like, you talk about championship mentality. He says it's week to week. If your cha- if your players only have a championship mindset week to week. That's why we have so much inconsistency. Because there's some games where the team just doesn't show up. And they just didn't show up in that UCLA game. The defense didn't look great to start the game. The offense had no pulls. The entire first half, they had no pulls. They took one unsportsmanlike penalty and one pass to Ja'Cory Barney that somehow allowed them to score seven points. Other than those, than that one play to Ja'Cory Barney, this offense had no pulls. No pulls. This is like things. It, it's very interesting. And I, and I and before this game, I was like, okay, Husker fans obviously want Nebraska to win this. As as a person covering this team, it'd be nice if this team would start winning. But in the back of my mind, I was kind of like, I kind of want to see what happens if Nebraska does <laughs> lose this game. Like that was kind of what was in the back of my You're mind. Terrible. Like it's it's so interesting to see what's gonna happen. Like I'm very intrigued to see what happens in this USC game, because in my opinion, this USC game is winnable. It's so winnable. All this team has to do is just rely on the run game, play solid defense, and they can win this game against USC. They can. 
Like, I have no doubt in my mind that this team could go and, and beat USC. I know they could. It Nebraska would, is just as talented of a team. It would take a little bit of it would, it would take a little bit of doing to be able to do it, I think for sure. And I think also when you and we'll talk about this more next week when we're doing previews for the USC game. One thing we do have to keep in mind though is when teams go west, usually it doesn't fare too well for them. Nebraska's got a they got a bit of a of a benefit because they of before the new Big Ten. So we're going back to the 14 team Big Ten. They were the furthest wet. They're the furthest west school. So their adventure to Los Angeles is not going to be as drastic as like a Rutgers is going to be, where they literally have to fly across the country. Yeah, Nebraska's okay. not. They're not going to necessarily have that. However, they're still going to have the time zone change. So there's something they're going to have to deal with. There's the possibility that their bodies are going to be playing a football game at 10 p.m. at night on their body clock if the game starts at like 7 p.m. for them that's a nine o'clock start which means the game's not going to be over till 10 30 you're playing till 12 30 in the morning I mean when Rutgers and USC played on the Friday night game I want to say that was either last week or two weeks ago I can't remember which week it was but it was a Friday night game and the game was scheduled to start at 11 p.m. Eastern. It was the lead out to the World Series. So that means Rutgers is starting the game at 11 p.m. at night on their body clocks. 11 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I believe USC won that game. I actually, I did not stay up and watch the game. I was tired and wanted to go to sleep. But that's the kind of thing that Nebraska might have to deal with depending on how the media draft goes for that week. So that's something to consider, but this is this is a big game coming up, and I know I don't want to like we we said this about UCLA. I will say this: this UCLA game was bigger, and because they lost this UCLA game, now the USC game is humongous. It's magnified all, even larger. All Nebraska had to do was just beat USC, UCLA, and this game, yes, it matters, but it's not like if Nebraska loses this, like if Nebraska would have beat UCLA. And lost a close game to USC. Like, Husker fans don't care. Like, that's not. They got their bowl game. It's not a huge deal. You're then just once you beat, if you would beat UCLA, you were just not playing. What what bowl game do you want to play in? How great of a bowl game do you want to play in? Now, you're fighting for your lives and having to fight all the bad rhetoric that's around this team right now. And it's not going to go away. And it's not going to go away until they win. Until they win, get that sixth win, and. I want to ask you this, Danny. Is Nebraska going to be favored in another game? No. No. They are not going to be favored in another game. Unless they go out and absolutely tr- trump, like, they just go out and kick USC's butt. May I, I still don't know if they'd be, they'd probably be favored against Wisconsin because it'd be, but, Wisconsin would be coming barely. out. barely. Like, they would have to really beat USC really, really well to be able to be favored against and, and that's, I just don't see that happening going to LA. So they're probably not going to be favored in another game this year, and if you're not favored in any of the games, and you currently sit at five five games, you could see how in the back of the fans' minds they're thinking, "Oh, we're probably not going to win another game." Something else I want to add into this whole cauldron that we're stirring here Ooh. is Nebraska's <laughs> Nebraska's on their second buy. Okay, we saw how they came out of the first buy. I got very animated. After the first buy, you remember how animated I got. You're a Husker Fanny. A little bit. I'm stirring the pot as but <laughs> I think that my animation was deserved. Was after... it deserved, Danny? I think it was. Okay. Okay. I think that it was deserved in the fact that you had two weeks to prepare for a team and you looked at them prepared. If Nebraska looks as unprepared as they did for Indiana as they do for USC. And I'll give them a little bit of a slack because they have to travel two time zones. So they'll get just a little bit of grace, but it's not going to be much. If they look as unprepared as they did against USC as they did for Indiana, then not only are the 
Um, the not only is the bad rhetoric going to be ear piercing, and it's going to be it's already ear piercing. It's going to be even more ear piercing than it is right now. It it is going to be so loud that you are going to be able to hear it all the way in the Atlantic Ocean. Like that's how loud it that's how loud it's going to get if they look unpre- as unprepared as they did when you have two weeks to get ready for it. They're going to let this loss sting for a little while. They're, I hope they're going to rest up a lot because they are banged up bad right now, and that is not helping their case. But they got to learn from this game and whatever they did in the last bye week because whatever they did in the last bye week did not work. So no matter what happens against USC, this is one of the things I'm going to be looking for. I'm not even going to put a ton of weight into the results, especially in the start of the game. What I'm really going to be looking for in the start of the game is how prepared are they? How motivated are they? Because that was not there when they went to Bloomington a couple weeks ago. So what is it going to look like this time? And that's going to, that's going to, and I don't mean to cut you off before you get started, but that's going to tell a lot about the coaches specifically specifically rule and i think there's a lot of pressure on him this bye week going into usc about getting his team ready to play with this extra time that they have yeah and and he said post game that i mean the last few teams that they've played have been coming off bye weeks yeah this is kind of how it works like ohio state came off a bye week ucla now came off a bye week indiana came off a bye week you also came off a bye week though so the Indiana one doesn't really make sense. But yes, Ohio State did come off, off of a bye week at, and then played you. UCLA came off a bye week and then played you. But that's just kind of how college football works. Like, I don't really understand what he's kind of saying there. Yeah. Like. I don't either. But. but and, 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 I mean, whatever. The one, and and I'm not really going to add much to that because it's all true. And if Nebraska goes and puts out a very poor product against USC, like, the game's not even close. I just wonder what the energy is like at that Wisconsin game at home. It's your last home game, chance to get your sixth win, finally break a losing streak against Wisconsin. What what would even be the turnout if Nebraska goes and loses the USC by, I don't know, 14, 17 points? I don't even know. I, honestly, I can't imagine it's going to be very good. Yeah. I think that... There would be a lot of sleepy fans coming back from Omaha when Nebraska plays Creighton the day before. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of people that are, especially students, depending on when this game starts. Actually, now that I think about it, it doesn't matter when this game starts. There's going to be a lot of students that just don't show up because they're going to go into the volleyball game later that night when they also play Wisconsin. That's... If they don't come out and and look somewhat competent against USC, if they don't even win the game against US, USC, I can't even imagine how many people are going to be there at that Wisconsin game. I mean, I'll the, tell I it, mean the stadium would be full, but it's not going to be full like it was for the Colorado game or the, the Illinois there, game. There will be no energy there. Yeah, it's going to be much like this. I mean, even in this UCLA game, the energy from the start was just low because of the way they started. Like, you just, you just have to start strong. Like, all Nebraska, if Nebraska goes and would have gotten a stop against UCLA and then scored on their first drive, the energy would have been crazy yesterday. It would, I mean, fans would be like, okay, we're going to get our sixth win. We've been praying for this. But that didn't happen. One last thing, because um, we're probably going to be wrapping up here pretty soon. Correct. Very good, Ben. One last thing I want to touch on. Okay. About the rule talk is all the people saying, oh, it's only rule second year. Like, n- like we don't, like, we still need more time on rule. I'm not, I'm not in all, no way saying we should fire rule. But I Glad think this is kind of, I'm, we're kind of on the precipice, though, of this is kind of like, we kind of have a sense of what this program is going to be like under rule. We saw. Indiana, Nebraska went to Indiana. Chris and Nettie hasn't even been there a full year. This is his first year. They had only played seven games, six games before in the Nebraska game. They were six and zero. They just first year head coach of Cincinnati there trounced Nebraska. Indiana is now nine and zero, by the way. 
which great story. Good for them. It's actually fun. Yeah. But it is. then Nebraska now UCLA also first year head coach John Foster. So for sure in the conference, by the way. Two teams with first year head coaches went and beat you, and it was not good. The Indiana game was horrible, and UCLA was not a good team, and they were up twenty seven to seven on you in the third quarter. These are two first year head coaches. That, and that's something we haven't even talked about. Like, yeah, using all, losing to Ohio State, yeah, Ryan Day's been there a while. That's This is Ohio State. They have more NIL money. They have better recruits than Nebraska does right now. Their coach has been there longer. They should beat Nebraska. But you're talking about Indiana, a team that Nebraska, Nebraska has everything on Indiana. Everything. Their coach has been here longer. We have better, Nebraska has better facilities, more NIL money, better fan base, all of that. Then UCLA, this is their first year in the conference. The school doesn't even care about football. They're tarping off half the Rose Bowl when they play home games. Like when they and, and it, they and they came and, and made you and made you look incompetent for three quarters. I mean, I, this, this that's the thing that's really getting to me is that you're just going. You're, you you're, all these first year coaches are, are coming and beating Nebraska. Like that's two first year coaches that came and beat you bad. Like it's not like you lost really close. Oh, it was a close, tough battle game. The UCLA, I mean, you were down twenty seven to seven to UCLA. Twenty seven to twenty does not tell the whole story. Like no. Nebraska got beat bad. And UCLA let them back into the game with unsportsmanlike penalties. Yeah. But I'm I'm a little different from where you are on this, just a little bit, because and if we're having the same conversation next year, I'm gonna be completely different with it. Some of it I think is who Rule has chosen to surround himself with. That's, a, that's an indictment on him, though. Yeah, yes, it's an indictment on him, but... Who says he's going to surround him? Like, who says, okay, Husker fans get what they want, they get rid of Satterfield. Who's to say that he's going to make a better hire? Well, as what I was going to say was, he. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he screwed up the first time by giving one of his coaching friends, if you want to call it that, old co-workers chance in an OC job like Satterfield's been around a long time he's probably earned the benefit of the doubt to at least get a shot at it see what he can do this probably wasn't the best fit for him but still give him a chance so let's say for the sake of argument that Rule and Satterfield part ways in the offseason and Rule starts to shuffle around the offensive room once Rule brings in that second OC, once he brings in that second offensive staff, he's not getting a third. And the pressure is going to be on next year if that move happens. The ripple effect that's going to happen if Rule makes that move to clear out the offensive staff or whatever he decides to do with the offensive staff, brings new people in, is that that's going to be his ne- that's going to be an now or never year. Yes. Yes. See, um, this is I'm, my thing though, is I always feel like these teams are always a year short before they go and get ready coaches. And I just don't want Nebraska to make another I'm not saying Rule should be gone after this year. I think he should be giving another year. But if he misses another bull game, don't give him another. Don't give him another. He's had three years. He should be able to make a bull game after three years in the program of this caliber. He should be able to. Scott Frost with the talent he has. Scott Frost should have been fired the year before. He should have been fired that offseason. He should have. But they kept him, and then you, you fire him after three games, and that entire season's ruined. Like that, You had no chance of really doing anything that season. You were proud of the team that they went and beat. That was the year they beat Iowa? Mm-hmm. Last game of the year. Like you, like, you were proud of that team. I think they finished three and or four and eight. I think they got four wins, yeah. That sounds right. Like, you... The pro- but the team was going out there and was competing, and you went and beat Iowa. Like that was like, for all things considered, that was a good year. <laughs> I mean, you. I mean, you. You was basically thrown away because you, for whatever reason, brought back Frost for another year. Like you only gave Mike Riley three years, and then you, for some whatever reason, gave Scott Frost a fourth year because oh, it's the greatest three and nine team ever. Oh, give it, give me a break. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. By the way, the greatest nine and three, three and nine team ever. I hated that. When your team constantly loses one score games, that's a reason. 
it's not like a oh we're so close it's a oh this is a trend there's a reason that nebraska keeps losing one score games like it like it wasn't like a oh nebraska's so close like it's no this is how things are going to be under scott frost make a move and if matt rule next year misses a bowl game again which next year's schedule is tougher easily could happen again don't bring him back a fourth year. Like I, I, I feel like teams always wait one year too long before they get rid of head coaches. A lot of the times, especially in Nebraska, they waited one year too long with Scott Frost. I don't want them to wait one year longer with Matt Rule. I'm not saying he should be fired right now. He should be given the benefit of the doubt. You gave him this program. Give him some time. But if you gave him ample time and he still hasn't shown it, then you need to move on. You have to move on. Okay, so you want next year's Nebraska football schedule for you? I do. Real quick, we'll end the show on that. Okay, so your non-con games, you start with Cincinnati. That's in Indianapolis. Then you get Akron and Houston Christian. So you get your lower tier FBS and then an FCS. Conference schedule, your away games at Maryland, at Minnesota, (laughs) not good. At Penn State, Mm. also trouble. At UCLA. Mm -hmm. Okay, your home games. Get Iowa, last game of the year. Winnable, but easily we could lose that game. USC comes here. Northwestern, probably up and win. Prob- probably, probably win. a win. And then both Michigan schools, Michigan and Michigan State, both are here. That's what I'm saying. Now, that I, spells I, trouble. I, I'm I'm telling you. So next year's schedule is tougher. It, it's tougher. Like it is. Like it just is. I'm saying there's a. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to happen. We have to see what happens over the offseason, what Rule does with his coaching staff, what recruits they get. All of that's going to—I mean, I'm not ready to say Nebraska's only going to win five games next year. We're so far away from that. We haven't even finished this year yet. But I just want to say the next year's schedule is tougher. It's tougher, right? And if you really want to get crazy, the schedule after that, 26, it's got it's got a, a school called Tennessee Volunteers on it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of other tough FB, a lot of other tough Big Ten teams. Like, I'm just saying, like, this was the year, Danny, this was the year to go and prove Rule knows, like, Rule's putting this program in the right spot. This was a gimme year. This was a year where you got gifted a very favorable schedule. Okay, here, here you go, 26, because just got it, just found it. Your FCS team is North Dakota. Tennessee comes here. Ohio comes here. Not not Ohio State, but Ohio. Ohio State actually does come here as well in Big Ten play. Your Big Ten st- schedule at Illinois, at Iowa, at Michigan State, at Oregon, at Rutgers. Indiana, Maryland, Ohio State, and Washington come here in 26. This does not get – this. I'm going to echo, echo what you just said. Give me your – this was their year to go and get seven, eight wins. This is what I'm saying. This was the year to go and get seven, eight wins. Now six get, wins get, 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 seems like a struggle to get to. It was the year to get eight, I mean, even nine wins. I mean, nine wins was gettable this year. It's not gettable anymore. But Oh, obviously, because you have three games left and you have exactly. five wins. It's literally not mathematically gettable. <laughs> well, but I mean, this, this was no, the, it, it, it is gettable if somehow they make it to a bowl game. I guess, but still, <laughs> I'm saying like to finish nine in the season nine and three. Okay, but like this was the year to get eight nine wins, get some recruits here, show that you're putting this team in the right direction, and get a better feel around the team, get more national attention, do all of that. You didn't accomplish any of that. You won that Colorado game. That was monumental. You had so many recruits here. The team saw you trounce Colorado. You up twenty eight to zero at halftime. You, like things were looking so great. I wrote an article about Nebraska finally having a winning team. Maybe finally have a winning team. Then you go out and every opportunity to move the needle, you whiffed on. You whiffed on Illinois. You whiffed on Indiana. You whiffed on Ohio State. And now you completely whiffed UCLA. UCLA. This is the worst loss of the year. Okay. Yes, this is the wanna, worst loss. This UCLA loss is worse than the Indiana one. The Indiana one was foundation shaking, but it kind of felt like a blip. You could you could you could argue, oh, this is a blip. You can go and look at all of Matt Rule's games that he's had prior 
this was a blip. I would have been like, okay, we'll see. But I could see where you're coming from. Right now, it does not look like a blip. It doesn't look like a blip. This is this is this is kind of a sign of things to come. And next year's schedule is going to be tougher. And the year after that's going to be even tougher. And this is the year to get eight or nine wins and get some recruits here, and you didn't do it. Now you have your back to the wall. Your back is to the wall now. You want to know what's going to have to happen next year? Like, if Nebraska doesn't make a bowl game this year, Dylan Royola is going to have to one come back, but two like. Be, he's going to have to play out of his mind, probably, for this team to go and get seven wins. I mean, if Nebraska gets six wins next year, is that enough to keep Rue around? Probably. Probably. To, he'd probably come back for fourth year if they get six wins. But then the bar would be raised. The bar would be raised. You'd have to do even better. It gets an even tougher schedule. But this this was the year. And that's why this is so disappointing, was that you just could have created so much momentum for your program this year, and you didn't. And you still can, and that's the thing. That's the thing people are forgetting. You still can. And I don't want to throw out the opportunity, the, the possibility, in in any universe that Nebraska wins the final three games and get the eight wins. Because if they do do that, you're feeling great after the season. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean you are. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, th- there's still a chance, but we gotta look at it realistically and say it's probably not gonna happen. Nebraska probably wins at most one more game this year. I think that's pretty fair to say. Yeah, I'd say so. I think Nebraska wins at most one more game this year. And even if they do get that one more win and get the sixth win, you're still not feeling great. You're still not feeling great about the future of this program and the future of this program under rule. That That's what I'm going to leave this on. It was a, he said missed opportunity. It was a missed opportunity. Yep. This entire season was a missed opportunity. And we're going to leave it at that. What a, what a way to end it. We will preview USC next week yeah we're gonna get into some usc stuff next week we've got the bye week we actually got two more shows coming this week we're gonna have a uh, volleyball centric show tomorrow we're gonna talk about nebraska's big win over wisconsin and madison and then talk about the northwestern game as well and then wednesday nebraska ball's back so we're gonna get into some isn't it crazy Nebraska ball is back? I know. It's bananas. We're going to get into some basketball. <laughs> you said Open- it's banana. <laughs> it is bananas. Uh, we're going to get... We have the it's season- bananas. Yes, it's bananas. This season's all bananas. <laughs> Stay is bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Okay. Right. We are get it. We got the opening games tomorrow. That Tomorrow, Monday, November 4th. So we're going to talk about those and continue to figure out what is going on with this football team ben this was much needed therapy session this was fun it was yes this was this was good to dissect all this we had i mean yeah i mean this is what i'm saying no matter like this program always like i i'm interested and that's just because it fa- I, i'm fascinated with not only great football but i'm fascinated by bad football too like it fascinates me how a team and a program that has so much could do so little it very, fascinates me. You have a very twisted mind. It's it's kind of <laughs> funny. It is like, kind of like, funny. I, it, it just like it just make like it, I'm. It's like you know you're reading a story, and you know it's like a like a horror story, but you still have to read it to know yeah. what happens. You're right. That's kind of what like I I was kind of saying. Yeah, remember when I was saying yesterday at the po- post game press conference, I was like, you know when there's like something that's really bad is happening and you want to look away. But you can't look away because yeah, you just got it. You got to see what's happening. I do remember that. That's kind of where I'm at with this football program. Is you want to look away. You want to just like not care about this football program. Like, you, like if you're a Husker fan, you just want to be like, ugh, like just get this out of my life. But you can't look away. You can't. You can't do it. Thank you for listening to Scarlet Fever. Thank you for watching over on YouTube if you were watching over there. Thank you, Ben, for stopping in. Thank you, Danny. It was very, very fun show. So Fun. With, fun. We got more shows coming out this F week. for friends who do stuff together. Be quiet. Here is for you and me. Be quiet. <laughs> um, so we'll be back later this week with some more stuff, and then USC Preview Week next week. Thank you for listening. And to Scarlet Fever, we will see you next time.